Welcome back to the channel. I've got a great video for everyone today. I just recently built a 10 inch DIY subwoofer and documented the whole process. So I'm gonna dive into the design and show you the actual build and we'll do some RTA measurements at the end so you can see how this sub measures up. If you like what you see, please hit the like button and consider subscribing. Let's get into it. So about six months ago, I put out a video documenting my very first DIY speaker build. It was a lot of fun and I got a lot of great feedback from all of you, the viewers. But one problem with those speakers is they didn't quite play low enough. So I thought, you know what, let's build a sub to pair with them to make a nice 2.1 system. So first let's start with the appearance. Now, if you saw the speaker build video, you will have noticed that those were very deep, narrow speakers. It's a profile that I love with speaker build. So for the sub, I kind of wanted to maintain that same thing. Also, it was very important that I kept that front black satin finished baffle with a wood veneer wrap around the rest of the cabinet. Now on this sub, I also put a black satin base just to keep the thing stable. Unlike my custom speakers, I didn't put this sub on spikes. Reason being is with subwoofers, I really like it when they're coupled to the ground and they shake the room that they're in. So didn't do any spikes. This thing sits right on the ground with just some rubber feet to keep it from uh, sliding around. So let me quickly touch on the components that I'm using. So the sub itself is driven by a 10 inch reference series subwoofer from Dayton Audio. This subwoofer has a recommended vented cabinet volume of 1.68 cubic feet. So I was able to put that into the build program that I'll be showing and that helped me determine the final dimensions that I ended up with. Now to drive the subwoofer, I'm using a class D 300 watt RMS bash amplifier. So the specs on this pretty closely matched what the subwoofer needed. And the end result was a fantastic pairing. Definitely a pairing I recommend if you're looking to build your first DIY subwoofer. Okay, so let's take a look at the inside of the sub so you can see what's going on. I'm just gonna peel back some of these layers. Okay, perfect. So it's really not that complicated. And I would say probably the most complicated part is how to create this venting system or the port. So what am I talking about here when I'm talking about a port? Essentially with subwoofer cabinets, there's really two ways you can go. You can go with a sealed cabinet, which is just an airtight box with the driver in it, or you can vent that box, allowing some of that air pressure and the sound waves coming off of the back of the driver to escape through a port. Now, depending on the length or size of that port, that is in turn going to tune that sub box to a certain frequency range. Now, when I was building this, I wanted to go with a 32 Hertz cabinet tuning to get this thing playing really low. So how did I figure out the port length. I'm still not smart enough to quite get the math down to figure out these uh, these port lengths. Yes, I've been watching a bunch of the great YouTube builders and I'm learning more, but for this sub box build, I ended up using this free online sub box builder. It allows you to put in some of your driver specifications and then manipulate the dimensions so you can achieve the sub box that you're trying to build. One of the best things about it is it will do the math for your port lengths depending on the cabinet that you're trying to build. Once that was done, I could take all of that back into my Vectorworks drawing and get the final dimensions that I needed before I started building this. So my first cuts always happen at the hardware store and conveniently the pieces for this build could all come out of a single piece of 8 foot by 4 foot 3 quarter inch thick MDF. Now the tallest cuts on this build are 2 feet 
and the widest are less than two feet. So at the hardware store, I had them cut the 8x4 sheet into 2x2 two two sections. Makes it really easy to transport and carry around. From those 2x2 two two pieces, I start cutting out bottom plates, top and bottom panels, side walls, internal port panel, front and back panels, and the front baffle. Making sure to mark them as I cut them. Once those are all cut, I move on to the front plate, back plate, and baffle cutouts. For the amp plate, it's gonna mount right to the surface. So I need a cutout big enough for the internal components to fit inside the sub, but small enough so that the plate will still sit on top and have something to screw into. So for the woofer cutout, the dimensions can be found on the manufacturer's website. Now to cut the hole, I use a circle jig with a hand router. When setting your router, I always recommend having some scraps around so you can test your cuts. I usually mess these cuts up at least once or twice. So to cut the inset hole, you need to do it in two passes. The first pass, you use a wide cutting bit to create that inset lip that the driver is gonna sit on. Then, you do a second pass with a thin cutting bit to remove the excess material on the inside of that lip. So once those holes are all cut, I take those front baffles and base plates to the router table and I use a hand router to do round overs on the edges to give it a really smooth look. So now that all my cuts are done, it's time for assembly. So I start by gluing the base plate and the bottom plate together. This sub is really heavy, so having a couple layers on the bottom is a good idea for structural integrity. I'm also adding a couple pieces of corner reinforcement where I can. So the corner reinforcement are 3 quarter inch by 3 quarter inch strips that run along all of the inside corners. They really help with assembly and reinforcing the seal in the corners. Next, I lay down the right wall and start gluing and nailing the bottom panels, back and top panel, and internal port panel. Now, before I glue the left wall on, I'm going to take advantage of the extra space and add some of those corner reinforcements in those hard to reach places. Now we secure the left wall, which was a tight fit and needed some convincing. Once it's all in, I clamp it, nail it, and let it dry. So once that's all dry and the last of the inner corner strips are in, it's time to add some acoustic damping material. Now I find these acoustic foam panels work really well for this and with a little spray on adhesive are pretty easy to install. Now I'm only adding foam to the main part of the cabinet, leaving the port section untouched. Now once all the foam is in, I can secure the front panel. So after that is secure, it's time to turn my attention back to the front baffle and get it ready for paint. But before that, I couldn't resist and I had to put the woofer into the cabinet to see how it sounded. Honestly, it was an emotional experience. Anyways, back to the front baffle. If you want to get an automotive quality paint finish, the key is sanding, sanding, sanding. Like, so much sanding. So before I paint, I hit the MDF with 100 grit sandpaper, then I go up to 150 grit, then 200, and so on until I get up to 800 grit. Now once that's done, I seal it with a shellac sealer, which stops the moisture from absorbing into the MDF and swelling it. Now I noticed a couple of you commented that diluting wood glue and water works really well for this. So this is definitely something I want to try in the future. So yeah, 
Sand it, seal it, paint it. Then, starting with a 400 grit sandpaper, working your way up to 5000 grit, sand each layer of paint. Again, the sanding is how you get that really, really smooth finish. All right, on to the veneer. Now, first thing I gotta do again is sand down the cabinet. I gotta make sure I get it nice and smooth and get rid of any defects or bumps. Now, once that's done, you can then apply the veneer. Now, last time I did this, I used this gel contacts, man. I can't remember what it was, but it was friggin' awful. This time around, I found this LePage stuff, which works so much better. So yeah, to apply wood veneer, first cut the panel you're going to install close to the size you need it, but a little bigger so you have some play when installing. Then you're gonna glue the surface it's sticking to, and you're gonna glue the panel and let the two of them sit for about five to 10 minutes so they get nice and tacky. When that's done, then take your piece Hover over where you're going to install it, line it up, and then start by sticking it to the middle and working your way out. Once you have everything stuck down, then take a roller and apply a bunch of pressure all over to really make sure everything's stuck. So to remove the excess veneer, you can use a router or you can do what one of my viewers suggested and lay the surface down on something flat and use a knife to cut around the edges. Now it took me a couple tries, but when I got used to this technique, it worked really well and helped to avoid chips, so thank you. So for final cleanup on the corners, you still have to use a file or some sandpaper to smooth it down. So once the corners are done, just like the front baffle, you want to sand that veneer down and get it really smooth. Once that's done, it's ready for stain. So I used a gel stain, which seems to be a pretty good way to stain veneer. You just put it on, make sure you don't put it on too thick, and then wipe off the excess. Now always with anything you're staining, I recommend that you test it out on a scrap piece first. So once the stain is dried for a good 24 hours, I recommend a quick sanding with a very fine grit, maybe 400 or up, just to smooth it out just a bit. But you just, you don't want to sand too much because you don't want to ruin the stain. But you want to get it smooth before you put on your final coat. So once that's done, you can then secure the front baffle. For the front baffle, as it isn't a structural piece, I only use glue to secure it to avoid any visible nail or pinholes. So once that was secure, this is when I decided to apply my final coat of Varathane. Now I could have done these parts separately and probably will in the future, but it still turned out fine doing it this way. So just like the paint, the key to a smooth finish is sanding between coats, starting from a 2000 grit and working your way up to a 5000 grit. Now between each grit, I recommend wiping down the surface with a clean damp cloth. Now as far as how many coats, I usually do about three to five. So last part of the build is installing the driver and play damp. Both are held in by screws, so make sure to pre-drill all the holes and be careful when using drills or power screwdrivers near the woofer. So as for connecting the two together, it couldn't be easier. The woofer has spring-loaded terminals and the plate amp has the speaker cable already attached. So you just connect the two and you're good to go.
So just a couple comments about this subwoofer. It's ridiculous. Like, not in a bad way. It just plays really low and shakes everything around. But admittedly, in its current configuration, it is better for certain applications and music genres. So what do I mean by this? Well, because it's able to produce such significant low end, it is amazing for home theater. Electronic music, hip hop, pop, amazing. But I found for rock and metal, having a little DSP or filtering in front of it to dial down some of that sub 40 hertz is nice. Also, when playing really loud, the sub probably would have benefited from some internal bracing. Now, I only noticed this when the sub was playing really loud, like way louder than I've ever played a sub. But it's awesome to know that A, it'll go that loud and that I can still improve on this design. Okay, so to show you what I'm talking about when I refer to how low this thing plays, I took some RTA measurements with pink noise. So for the comparison, I've got this sub, a Klipsch 12 inch reference premiere sub and a Mackie 10 inch studio subwoofer. So for the test, all of the subs are set wide open and measured at the same SPL. So here's how the Mackie measured. You can see here, it falls off just past 125 Hertz, which is normal and peaks around 70 Hertz with a slow descent from there, the little bump around 35 Hertz. Now let's take a look at the Klipsch sub. So same fall off around the 125 Hz range, but as you can see, a much more even response down to the 31 Hz range. So here's the Mackie stacked on top for comparison. So finally this sub. So again, you'll notice the consistent fall off around the 125 Hz, but look at the energy in comparison in the 32 Hz range. Pretty impressive. Now, does this mean I built a better sub than the Klipsch? No, that's stupid. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I couldn't really do a audio demo of this thing because like, how are you gonna hear how a sub performs through your iPad or your smartphone speakers? Like any video I've ever seen where people have like subwoofer demonstrations, it's just like <laughs> Anyways, imagine it doing that, sounds great. So thanks for watching. I hope you were inspired. Build plans below. We'll see you next time.